Hello, Jeremy Parker here for another in-depth restoration story. This time it's about a very cool and important synthesizer, the Roland SH-1000, which was Roland's very first synthesizer to market in 1973, and the start of the venerable SH line of synthesizers, and really every other keyboard that Roland has made since. So I have to say that the SH-1000 holds a special place in electronic instrument history. This SH-1000 actually belongs to a good friend of mine and fellow musician, Big Ben Hillman, who asked me to take a look at it for him and maybe fix it up a bit. As was established in a previous video, I'm pretty good at procrastinating on these kinds of projects. So this might have been 10 to 15 years ago that he gave me this keyboard. It's just been sitting idle and collecting dust all this time, up until a couple of months ago, and so I felt terrible that I've made Ben wait so long. To make it right, I figured that I would go through everything electronically, mechanically, and cosmetically that I could to make it as nice as possible, above and beyond what he had likely wanted me to do. I am very happy with how it turned out, and so this video documents the restoration in all the excruciating yet deeply satisfying details. I also composed all the music for this video featuring the sounds of this SH-1000, and there's a special little jam at the end, so stay tuned for that. But first, what the heck is this thing and what does it sound like? At the onset of the 1970s, Standalone synthesizers were still relatively large, expensive, and marketed mainly towards serious musicians and studios. Things started changing when Moog introduced the Mini Moog in 1971 as a more portable and affordable instrument compared to their initial modular offerings. Still though, at around $1600 new, that comes out to be about $9000 in today's money. And keep in mind, that's for a monophonic synthesizer. In the meantime, the home and theater organ market was already well established and very competitive coming out of the 1960s, with manufacturers incorporating more advances in transistorized sound generation. There was a demand in the organ market for more advanced sonic capabilities, and by 1975, for example, Hammond had dropped its electromechanical tonal generator system in order to remain competitive with the changing times. Organs were beginning to sound and operate more like synthesizers. In a way, these two markets collided, and Roland Corporation of Japan, which was established in 1972, saw an opportunity to create a much more affordable yet capable instrument that might appeal to a wider audience including both working musicians who wanted a synth and the home enthusiasts who already had an organ. So just one year later, in 1973, the SH-1000 was launched at a price of around $600 and was designed with the aesthetics and use case of sitting atop an organ console. Although it looks neat on its dedicated stand, these nifty adjustable feet on the bottom make it easy to set down on the organ at just the right angle. Also a mono synth, the instrument featured 37 keys, a simple user interface, and some controls that would be familiar to anyone who had used an electronic organ. The SH-1000 was one in a line of similar units offered in this form factor throughout the 1970s, with many competitors clearly answering the call. In fact, my next restoration project could be this Univox Mini Korg K2 that I inherited, one of Korg's first synthesizers in the same 70s mini synth style. There are quite a few good videos on the SH-1000 and many more on the theory of subtractive synthesis out there already, so I'll just briefly run through the features and then give a quick demo on how to make a sound. Okay, to start off with, you've got a single divide down style VCO with all these tabs here that let you engage any combination of waveform type or octave range that you want. And it's set up very much like an electric organ. And then up on the top panel, we have a couple LFO controls, vibrato and tremolo, the noise source adjustment, a random note generator, glide, pitch adjust, portamento, the VCF is just a single low-pass filter style with 
cutoff frequency and resonance. And then these knobs here let you adjust how it get, gets modulated. Then the envelope here can be applied to the VCF or the VCA. And all those assignments are done here down on these tabs. Um, over on the right side, there are a bunch more tabs that are just basically preset sounds that are patches really of all these controls that are accessible instantly. So you can go between a sound that you have set up and any of these preset sounds. So that's, that's kind of a cool feature. Okay, so here's a quick example of the type of sound you can get out of the synth. I'll press a few of these tabs down. Adjust the filter. And I'll put the envelopes on the VCA and VCF. And then I'll show you what the wah sounds like. It's kind of similar to what I had. And then the growl. You've got vibrato and tremolo. So that's just a little taste of what you can do pretty easily with this synth. One little quirk that I did want to point out is the fact that if you're holding down a note, the keyboard won't re-trigger if you play above that note, only below it. So it's kind of a bummer, but you kind of get used to it after playing the keyboard for a bit. So now you know a bit about how the SH-1000 works and sounds. Although a couple of months ago when I first powered it on, I didn't know too much about the synth honestly, and I had no idea what state it was in, functionality wise. Here we are, and uh, I managed to get some, some sounds out of it, although it's, uh, it's a bit scratchy, as you can probably hear. I have it plugged into this, this little amp here. <laughs> And I think it needs a good cleaning for sure. Fortunately, it seemed that things functioned more or less aside from the noise issue. So if cleaning the electronics and electromechanical components was all that was required, it would be a relatively easy job compared to what I had to go through on the roads. However, Cosmetically, I had no idea at the time what I was going to do to improve the look of the synth. Aside from cleaning everything, I felt there wasn't much else I could easily do, as the veneer wasn't in great shape overall. I did discover more damage to the cabinet, with one side panel basically falling off, and the other having some damage to even the underlying wood. As I'm not really an expert in veneers and wanted to use materials I had on hand, I began to formulate a plan in my head to basically remake the side panels and possibly paint over the other pieces to give the whole synth a new look. First things first, I had to start taking the SH-1000 apart. Probably the first time since it rolled off the Roland factory floor over 40 years ago. As I got deeper into taking things apart, I could see how dirty it was and all the lurking dust bunnies, so I basically vacuumed and blew out areas as I could access them. The control panel started coming out first, revealing the power supply board. I was happy not to see any leaking or exploded electrolytic capacitors. The keyboard assembly came out next. It was very cool to see this original Roland inspection certificate with the serial number. Using the handy online SerialNumberDecoder.com website, which is great by the way, and includes all sorts of keyboards, guitars, hi-fi equipment, and other things, I found out this particular unit was made in February of 1974. I took some pictures of the cabling for reference 
also noting many adjustment pots that would need cleaning and readjustment later on. The underside of the keyboard revealed the contact system, which I would later clean. Eventually, the guts of the keyboard were freed from the cabinet so that I could work on the cabinet down in my basement shop separately. There was some minor support damage internally, and the serial number plate had to get straightened back out. I had some leftover cabinet grade birch plywood, so I thought the side panels might actually look nice in a glossy finish with the plies showing. Since the top and back veneers were going to be painted over black, I didn't have to worry about matching wood or stain colors for the side pieces. I traced out the shape of the stock side panel on the plywood and started cutting out the new pieces. I kept the two new pieces clamped together while I shaped them to match. They were definitely going to look better than the old pieces, so I kept going on the sanding, filling, and shaping. In preparation for the newly made side pieces, I had to pull off the left hand piece that was still attached and square up the sides of the remaining cabinet to get the mating surfaces ready. I used my miter sled on the table saw. Then cleaned things up with my chisels. I love biscuits, both the woodworking kind and the food kind. The dry fit on the side pieces was looking good, so I wanted to turn my attention to the finishes that would be applied to everything with gluing the pieces together as the final step for the cabinet. I decided to see how far I could take a tongue oil finish towards being glossy, which would require and did require many coats and a lot of sanding. So I made some work sticks to allow easy clamping and holding while I did this work. In the meantime, I started sanding and prepping the other parts of the cabinet for paint. The opening in the cabinet for the back panel seemed like it could use rounding over for easier access to the jacks, so I used a round over a bit on my router to do the job. I still had plenty of the tough textured Duratex black paint here, so the areas that had shown the most wear and scratches over the years could be done in Duratex, which included the bottom and back panels, with just the top panel above the keys and the cheek box being done with regular black spray paint and a satin poly clear coat to give those pieces a more refined finish. The spray painted pieces were primed first then several coats of paint, then several coats of clear satin poly. The Duratex pieces had maybe four coats or so, and the texture came out nicely in the end. Here's how the last coat looked right after going on with the sponge roller. The tongue oil finishing took much longer, as it turned out, with wet sanding in between coats, trying different techniques as I went, and eventually I got something that I was happy with. I used some gasket tape under the music desk lip and reassembled the top piece. Then I flattened out the serial number plate and chiseled out an area on the bottom of the cabinet so it could sit more flushly with the bottom and not get caught and bent in the future. I glued the damaged mounting points back together. Finally, it was time to glue and clamp the side pieces on and get this cabinet back together. Overall, I think it came out really nicely. In the meantime, I had also been working on the keyboard assembly. I pulled all the springs off, removed all the keys, and prepped everything for a thorough cleaning. 
The key contacts were all cleaned individually with Q-tips and some deoxit. Looking closely, you can see the fine wires that contact the bus bars. So these were the surfaces that needed careful cleaning. One of the felt stop strips had come off, so I used some double-sided tape to reattach it. I cleaned the top surface and got it ready for the keys to go back on. The front panel tabs were removed next. I washed those tabs along with the key guides and knobs in some soapy water. Then I cleaned each key with some Windex. I put the key guides back on and got ready to reinstall the keys. Since I had just cleaned and re-greased the action on my Yamaha P120, I had plenty of the Dow Corning Molly Coat 111 left, which is a long-lasting damping grease meant for plastics and rubber. Originally, there was evidence of grease used on the action, but it had long since dried out, so I decided to put the Molly Coat 111 on all the key guide surfaces as I reassembled the action. Immediately, I could tell the grease helped quite a bit with the feel of the action, making it smooth and quiet, almost like new. I plugged the keyboard back into the rest of the synthesizer and noticed another big improvement. And now it's completely quiet until I play a note. So, much better. The next thing to be done on the electronics was to clean all the potentiometers, switches, connectors, and retouch any solder joints. I noticed a Molex connector on the power supply board that needed some attention, and I decided to add some quick connect terminals to the neon power indicator light. This way I was able to remove the front panel entirely and more easily access and clean the faders and pots. After spraying the faders with deoxit, the existing damping grease ended up getting removed, which is typical. So I used the same molly coat grease on the sliding surfaces on the inside of the faders. The right way would have been to completely disassemble each fader, but clearly I'm a slacker, so I managed to finagle the grease in there without taking anything apart further or getting grease down on the carbon tracks. I didn't see any evidence of leaking caps or anything else that really needed attention, so I looked in the service manual, which I had tracked down on manualslib.com in order to see about any calibration or adjustments that should be made. I followed the instructions for the tuning adjustment, which was a series of three potentiometer adjustments while reading the frequency off of three different F notes across the keyboard. The point of this adjustment was to set the nominal tuning of the synth with the front panel pitch knob at zero, as well as establish linearity of the keyboard VCO pitch tracking. There were several other adjustments for the VCA and VCF, but I'm not going to bore you with those details. Another thing that needed attention was the power plug, which was not originally polarized. With the plug in the AC outlet one way, I only measured a volt or so between chassis ground and earth ground from the outlet, which indicates the correct line and neutral connection. But the other way caused there to be something in the range of 50 volts AC RMS between the chassis and earth ground. This could definitely cause issues when plugging the SH-1000 into other gear, as the ground of the audio output would have a pretty high leakage voltage on it. So I cut the stock plug off and put a new one on with the correct connections between line and neutral and the SH-1000's power supply. So the electronics were back in order, and since I had cleaned all the knobs and tabs, it was time to get those back on.
One of the original knobs was missing, so I had one on hand that didn't match but would actually function better on the pitch control because its position was much easier to see at a normal viewing angle, while you'd have to be looking almost straight down on the original style knob to see where it was at. Kind of an important control to be able to quickly monitor, so I'll call this an improvement. I had also noticed that several front panel tabs needed to be straightened out, with one of the plastic pieces actually being bent. By carefully applying some heat to the plastic, I was able to straighten it back out. So at last, it was time for final reassembly of the SH-1000. One thing I usually do when putting things back together is to look for any surfaces that could rub or buzz and put foam gasket tape in between. It drives me crazy to hear metal or plastic panels buzzing in my studio when playing music or driving in my car or anywhere else really. I don't know, I'm weird like that. The black gasket tape also serves to fill any open gaps and gives a clean look to things. I used masking tape to serve as a guide for placing the gasket tape down for exactly where the reveal should be. But man, this is my favorite part, to see the instrument finally coming back together with a brand new look and feel, totally functioning. So here we are again at the end of another restoration journey in my journey through space and time or mostly time with this particular Roland SH-1000. Ben, your keyboard is ready and I'm sorry it took 15 years and a global pandemic for it to finally happen. And to everyone else still watching this video, thanks for your patience with my extreme levels of OCD and I hope you enjoyed seeing this project come together. As promised, Here's a funky little number to take us home. Until next time.